Good evening. Uh, what a privilege it is to be teaching such a great group of people gathered here. Uh, it's always odd, isn't it? Uh, daylight savings. It feels so much later than it is. You came in, in out of the darkness and uh, we'll send you back into the darkness in a short while, but it's only six o'clock. It's hard to believe. Uh, I'm uh, just thrilled to be with you all tonight talking about um, really a, a topic that is of uh, keen interest for me uh, and the fact that others might want to hear it uh, is just uh, an added delight. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, let me give a few thank yous before we move on. Um, uh, Celeste Pruitt, um, uh, sadly she, she's sick. A lot of people are, are sick right now. She's, she's ill, so she wasn't able to come and she didn't want to spread her germs, but she put a lot of work into uh, making tonight and as well as the Aletheia series uh, in general a reality. So thank you to Celeste. Uh, Emma Roddy as well, um, who works in you know, events extraordinaire. She likewise has put in so much work in making uh, these events possible. So thank you to Emma and thank you to Kelly Noonan, who's uh, uh, always working hard publicizing things, recording things, getting the cameras working. So thank you, Kelly. Uh, your work is greatly appreciated. So uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for uh, coming this evening. It's a, it's a privilege to uh, talk about uh, subjects that I am passionate about with all of you. And um, I hope and uh, pray that uh, you will glean something of benefit from what I have to say tonight. Uh, without any more ado, um, uh, the, the topic over the next three weeks will be, well, the title of this series is Telling Tales, uh, the Mythic Imagination of Tolkien and Lewis. Uh, two great figures, two great writers, uh, two great Christian imaginations of the 20th century. Uh, and in particular, what I want to look at with uh, you all is myths or, or stories. Uh, uh, rather than the, the kind of brute facts that we spend a lot of our lives with, uh, what uh, these two figures uh, uh, did is that th they told stories that appealed deeply to the imagination, that spoke of uh, other worlds, uh, that spoke of the deeper truths uh, woven into our world in a way that, that actually connected with people who were far beyond the pale of Christian belief and practice. Uh, and that, uh, that perhaps, and in indicating where I'll be going later on in this lecture, that uh, is an indication of the, the power of a myth or the power of a story. That it can captivate people that uh, are even hardened against the, uh, the truths of the faith. Uh, might find themselves, well, what is it that uh, we get in Shakespeare's Hamlet? Uh, the story, the play, the myth. Uh, it has a kind of power that is uh, difficult to put into words, uh, but we're going to try uh, without divesting it of all of its mystery. I think I'm going to skip ahead some things. I, 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 one thing I learned from uh, Pastor Alex at the last lecture is that uh, you, it's possible to finish early. <laughs> so for the first time ever, I might try that tonight, so we'll see what happens. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip in a little bit, and I'm going to start with a, a story. This is actually a very old story. Um, it's one of the oldest stories that we have. Um, uh, this one in particular comes from the Greeks. Uh, there was a, a man named Orpheus. Orpheus, uh, he had a particular gift, which was the gift of music. He played the lyre and he sang. And when he, when he sang and he played his harp, uh, old men dreamed dreams, young men saw visions. Uh, the, the hearts of the hardest were melted uh, uh, because of an encounter with beauty. Now, uh, what, we, what we know now, I've been reading uh, a bit on the psychological development of the brain. What we now know is that uh, young children uh, develop the uh, capacity for music uh, significantly before they uh, develop the capacity for language. And that's, why, that's, of course, why we talk to children in uh, baby talk. It's not because they, under, they don't have, they have the vocab vocabulary to understand what we're saying. Uh, it's, uh, we speak in these tones uh, that communicates far more than the words that we're using. 
I mean, often we just butcher the words, uh, make up all kinds of words, but they get the, the music of the words that we're speaking. And actually, in the development of their brains, uh, they go on to understand uh, language in a deeper sense only insofar as they first uh, hear the tone or the music uh, uh, behind the words. Uh, only then can they go on and really adequately understand the words in which uh, we're saying. And they develop their vocabulary, which is a powerful thing. Now, uh, I suppose that when someone like Orpheus plays his music, uh, it melts hearts because in some way he creates some pathway down to that primal music that we all would have learned uh, from the voice of a mother or a father. So Orpheus, he plays his music uh, and remarkable things happen. He has a gift. Uh, well, he was uh, playing his music for the nymphs and the people of the forest uh, outside of the you know, civilized city. Um, and he captured the heart of a young, beautiful woman named Eurydice. Uh, it was love at first sight. Uh, and soon after this, uh, Orpheus and Eurydice were, uh, were married. Presiding over the marriage was Hymenaeus, who's the god of marriage, uh, who blesses their marriage and then gives a prophecy that the perfection which they currently enjoy uh, will uh, soon be lost. Yeah, I know, it's not a... <laughs> Sometime later, uh, again, in the forest among the nymphs and the people who dance out in the forest under the silver light of the moon, uh, a young, rapacious man uh, sees Eurydice and begins to pursue her. And she flees from him and she flees directly into a nest of vipers where one of the vipers strikes her upon the heel. Uh, she quickly uh, grows ill. Uh, and uh, succumbs to uh, the, the poison of the viper and she, she dies. Uh, of course, Orpheus, uh, who, you know, he's a musical type, so he feels deeply. Uh, uh, he is devastated. Uh, after mourning for a while, he decides uh, he's going to uh, take a journey of great risk. Uh, and so he, he embarks upon a journey into the underworld where no mortal shall go. Uh, but he, he gets through the gates of the underworld as a, a, a living man uh, because whenever he plays his music, uh, uh, all of the, the doors open and every gate is open unto him. Uh, he even encounters on his way down into the depths of the underworld uh, to fetch Eurydice. He encounters Cerberus, the three-headed dog that will later be destroyed, killed by, uh, by Hercules. Uh, and he woos the beast into a stupor by, again, playing his music. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the power of music, isn't it? It can, uh, you know, like a story, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, music can melt hearts. Uh, he, uh, he descends all the way down into the, the furthest depths of the underworld, and there he encounters Hades, who is the god of the underworld. Uh, and he makes his appeal in song uh, to uh, fetch Eurydice and bring her back to the land of the living. And the music he plays is so beautiful. Uh, and the story he tells moves the heart of Hades uh, that he, he relents and he allows... Orpheus to take Eurydice back to the land of the living. This is good news. Although this is a Greek story, so. <laughs> There's one condition, however. Uh, Orpheus is to lead uh, Eurydice uh, with her just behind him, lead her by the hand, but he is not allowed to turn and look at Eurydice, uh, lest the deal is off. Uh, and she vanished once again into the darkness of the underworld, never to return. Orpheus, of course, he leads her, uh, hearing her footsteps behind him, holding uh, her hand in his, leading her up out of the depths of the underworld uh, until uh, he is on the very threshold of the land of the living, the sunlit realm of the living. And at that moment, uh, wanting a more secure, uh, more security in uh, the promise, uh, as he takes his final step into the sunlight, 
He turns and looks. Uh, he sees her for one moment uh, and she vanishes back into the darkness. Well, gosh, what a story. There's, there's much that could be said about this story. Uh, numerous interpretations uh, uh, that could be given of this story. Uh, but I want to talk about what C.S. Lewis calls the tragic dilemma, which is, which is this. We have a whole host of experiences, uh, keen pleasures, uh, deep pains, uh, experience upon experience that are deeply meaningful to us. Uh, but what happens is when we turn to look at the experience and put it into words, have you ever experienced this? Have you ever uh, encountered this? Uh, the moment you turn to it and scrutinize it with some sort of more analytical gaze, what happens to it? It, uh, it sort of vanishes away. You say, well, I, I wish I had words to tell you what you mean to me, let's say. And then when you, when you turn, you know, your more analytic, the more analytical side of your mind and you begin to look at it and seek to put it into words, the, the whole thing vanishes and disappears back into the darkness. The whole thought just comes apart. And so we're left with, on the one hand, C.S. Lewis says, uh, experiences that are deeply important, but they, we want words to describe them. On the other hand, a, a more rational way of thinking that the moment it turns its, uh, its gaze to the kind of deeper aspects of our lives and our existence, that which gives it meaning, we find there are no words and the experience itself just slips away. And, you know, this could take lots of mundane forms. Uh, it could be uh, at an art museum. This is my curse in an art museum. I want to go and enjoy the art and I find myself starting to analyze it and find I'm not enjoying it any longer because I've turned, the, the whole, the beauty of it just slips away the moment I start trying to think about it. Uh, we encounter this with loved ones where we want to communicate to them what they mean to us but the moment we try and find the words they're gone. Uh, as students we have great ideas for our essays and the mo and it's a, intuition and then the moment you try and put it into words it's, there's writer's block and the whole thing just evaporates. You know what I, do you understand? And, um, and in some cases it's trivial and in some cases uh, it's an agonizing desire to find the, wor to find the words uh, that uh, could possibly express that which is meaningful to us. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. He says this is our dilemma either to taste and not to know or to know and not to taste or more, strictly, or more strictly, to lack one kind of knowledge because we are in an experience, or to lack another kind because we are outside it. As thinkers, we are cut off from what we think about. Uh, what he's saying here is some who are constantly analyzing uh, are uh, separated from the realities that give meaning to life. You know, uh, thinking their way through an art museum and then applying that to all of life, stuck in the head uh, and uh, devoid of the meaningful experiences. And others are caught in wordless experiences and struggle with the, ang uh, the anguish of trying to find uh, just the right words to express it because there's something within us that wants to express it. So as thinkers, we are cut off from what we think about as tasting, touching, willing, loving, hating, we do not clearly understand. The more lucidly we think, the more we are cut off. The more deeply we enter into reality, the less we think. You cannot study pleasure in the moment of nuptial embrace, nor repentance while repenting, nor analyze the nature of humor while roaring with laughter. So we have, what, what he's saying is here, we have two uh, terribly different ways of knowing the world um, and there's something within us that desires to bring those two together in a way that will make us whole. Uh, 
J.R.R. Tolkien, um, who we'll be talking about quite a bit uh, uh, this evening and uh, over the next few weeks, um, somewhere in the deep background of his, the stories that he told, and we're familiar perhaps with The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and those more accessible stories, but he had a deep tapestry of uh, mytho mythology behind these stories. Uh, and one of them is, uh, concerns two trees that are in the realm of the gods. Uh, there is one tree which glows with a golden light like the sun, uh, and another tree which glows with the more pale light of the moon. Uh, and what these two trees, what they do is, you know, while the, uh, the one tree is shining, the other is dark, uh, and then there's a brief twilight, uh, and then uh, the light of the sun from the one tree grows dark, and then it's the light of the moon, so it's day and night within the realm of the gods. Uh, and what, what Tolkien means us to understand is that these two trees represent two different ways of knowing. Uh, the one is the tree of logos, or logic, you know, the rational mind, and that's one way to know the world. Uh, and the other is uh, the, the light of mythos, or story, or metaphor, or song, which is another way to know the world. And, and the time to be alive, when everybody's really alive, is when the light of both, for a brief moment in that twilight, uh, shine together. And then there's a greater richness to all of reality. Well, C.S. Lewis, he, he, he talks about the tragic dilemma. What then is the solution to the tragic dilemma? That we want to both experience and to know, to experience the riches that reality has to give us, but also to find some words that could possibly express it. And it's hard to even uh, articulate why we desire these things to go together, uh, but if you've ever just struggled to find the words uh, in an important moment, you know. Uh, I think the answer, the answer that Tolkien and Lewis uh, t uh, say, give to us, maybe a partial answer to this tragic dilemma, is myth or story. You know, the moment when, well, okay, so maybe we could understand it this way. Why is it that Jesus does not say, uh, you know, all of the countless acts you do on behalf of the kingdom uh, actually do have significance. God can bless those. Uh, just keep on uh, doing the good actions, planting the seeds. Keep on doing the good work in the small ways. Don't get discouraged. What's going to happen is that God's going to give those growth. Um, and he's going to bless it and others through the little acts of goodness and kindness and righteousness that you do. Uh, others will be blessed far and wide. Or he could just say, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds. Uh, but when it grows, it becomes the largest of all the trees in the garden, and the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Well, don't we need both? You know, it's nice having a, a story that has a kind of richness, a density to it that is sort of inexhaustible. Uh, and it also needs explanation. I would suggest that we could have both. So I'm going to risk something this evening. I'm going to risk the backward glance of Orpheus. I'm going to tell you some stories, and then I'm going to seek to offer some explanations. But it's, it's the story, the myth that's the thing that unites uh, the two ways of knowing. And it's the power of a story. This is, I suppose, why when he wants to elicit some sort of remorse from King David, who has um, taken another man's wife, killed that man, Uriah the Hittite, uh, and has, has uh, sought to also cover up his crime uh, so that nobody knows. The story about uh, a poor man and a rich man. Um, and how the rich man took the lamb of the poor man, slaughtered it, and sinned against him with impunity. And David's indignant. He doesn't know at that moment that he's indignant at his own sin. And then, David, then Nathan can say, you are the man. Don't you see? That's the power of the story. Okay. Uh, over the course of the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at uh, a number of aspects of the stories that Tolkien and Lewis have uh, uh, have given us. Today we'll be looking at uh, 
the story of creation as we get it in C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew and J.R.R. Tolkien's The Silmarillion, which very few have read. Um, it's only recently that I, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, next week we'll be looking at The Battle of Good and Evil. Uh, and third, we'll be looking at uh, the story of redemption. And I think what we'll find is, uh, in fresh and exciting ways, uh, these two men, Tolkien and Lewis, you know, these Oxford professors, uh, they told the old, old story of the Bible in a way that could uh, garner a fresh hearing from people who want nothing to do with religion. The power of the story. So we'll be sort of retracing uh, uh, the the basic lineaments of the Christian story uh, as they come to us in these modern myth makers. Uh, first, a, a couple of stories. Actually, one story and one uh, failure of a story. Uh, in Bede, uh, Bede's Venerable, the Venerable Bede's Ecclesiastical History of the English People uh, needs a better title. Uh, he, he tells the story of uh, 7th century Northumbrian pagans. So they're in England, uh, uh, deep in the pagan past of England. Uh, there is a, a young missionary by the name of Edwin who goes to Northumbria, and his unenviable task is to go to the court of King... Uh, no, 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 it's not Edwin. Well, go to the Northumbrian king's court, uh, and uh, present to him the gospel. And you know, these are pagan people. You know, they're go what, you know what they believed about the world's origin? That, uh, that it, it began with uh, a realm of ice and a realm of fire, uh, and somehow in the middle of the two grew a giant named Umir. And then uh, uh, some sort of heroic frost giant arises and slays Umir, and out of Umir's slain carcass begins fashioning the world. Like the, his, his skull becomes the dome of the sky, and his brain becomes the clouds, and his blood becomes the sea. I mean, just brutal. And, and the gods that they served were capricious, wicked, vicious gods who lived for only the glory of battle. Uh, and slaying enemies and then turning on their friends uh, for nothing other than the delight of violence. So they, that's what these people are. You imagine going to give the gospel to these people. Well, Edwin, uh, he, uh, he preaches the gospel uh, and the king and his court, they begin to confer and say, well, there's something, something to this. Uh, and then one of the uh, noblemen of the Northumbrian king spoke up to Edmund and said, and, and likened what he was saying, the story of the gospel, the story of creation, he likened, um, likened where they all were at, to a sparrow flying uh, through a meat hall. So he says, um, life as we understand it is like this. Um, uh, a sparrow flies in out of wintry darkness uh, into one end of the mead hall and for one brief moment all is bright and warm until the sparrow flies out of the other end of the mead hall back into wintry darkness. Such is the life of man. For a short time he is safe from wintry storm but after a little space he vanishes from your sight back into the dark winter from whence he came of what went before, human life, and of what is to follow, we are utterly ignorant. If therefore this new faith, this new story that you have told us can give us more certain knowledge, uh, then I say we give it a hearing. Uh, and this speech was enough to uh, prompt the, uh, the conversion of the king, all of his court, and all of the land of Northumbria. You know, whole people converted. Now why is it? It's because Edwin showed up telling a better story uh, that gave more certain information, uh, but also gave, uh, uh, gave these people a sense of where they came from and where they're going. Uh, and that, that is the power of the story of creation that Christians have to tell. It tells us where we're from. 
You know, we're not, we're not just floating randomly about on some cinder in an ever-expanding universe that has no greater rhyme or reason to it other than it, it began with a, a bang and will uh, end in ice spinning farther and farther and farther out into an endless, meaningless cosmos. That's not the story. The story is creation coming forth from God and then the purpose of life returning to him. You see the difference. That's the, that's the story of creation. What's the story of the modern world? Uh, I don't know if you've ever read this, uh, uh, this play, Waiting for Godot. Uh, that's time, I'll, that's, you know, those are hours of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> uh, what is Waiting uh, for Godot about? Um, well, it's sort of like a, well, well, it's Seinfeld, you know, the show about nothing. Uh, this is about people talking uh, while they're waiting for Godot, who never shows up. And that's the story. Uh, and that, I mean, and it's a, it's a sort of obvious, I mean, it, it's excruciatingly obvious. Uh, that's what I say about literature I don't particularly like. <laughs> you say, oh, that's, that's a bit obvious. But it is, it's excruciatingly obvious. What's the story that it's telling? It, the, the, the entire narrative of waiting for Godot is that there is no coherent narrative in the end. And why would there be? What is it that most people believe about the origin of the universe, the origin of our world, the origin of our species? Uh, it's that uh, there is a random chance that has somehow contrived uh, to produce this spinning globe upon which we live our lives that is getting ever and ever further away from everything else. Um, and eventually, you know, not just our lives, but even the life of our planet will just be snuffed out. And whether that's millions of years or billions of years, it doesn't matter, but it's surely going to happen. So here we are, you know, anxiously living our lives on this, uh, you know, spinning rock in empty space, you know, in the vacuum of space, trying to cobble together some sort of meaning in our lives that ultimately, well, eventually just the, uh, the bottom is going to open up and we're going to fall through and enter once again into, you know, what is the original reality, which is the void of space. And however lives might be dressed up or uh, lived in distraction, you know, in our more reflective moments, if this is the, the story or the lack of a story with, with, within which we live our lives, uh, this is reality. Waiting for Godot and Godot never shows up. The story of our lives is, well, we cobble some narrative together that ultimately will unravel. Now, most people who sort of live their lives in this way, most people will not pause to actually in any sort of existentially serious way reflect upon this. Uh, but this, uh, this is what underlies the, uh, the narratives that uh, people within a secular age live their lives. But what if, what if you could tell a better story? And that story would be so compelling that well, gosh, on the, on the power of the story, you know, telling a better story, uh, on the power of that, people might give Christianity a hearing. Uh, that, uh, despite their vast differences, that was the goal of both Tolkien and Lewis. Uh, to, as Emily Dickinson says, they're going to tell the truth, but tell it slant. On to Lewis. Uh, this evening I'd like to look at uh, Lewis's The Magician's Nephew. Uh, this is quite a story. It's the, it wasn't the first of the Chronicles of Narnia that was written, but it's uh, now numbered in the first chronologically uh, in the uh, series of Chronicles of Narnia, uh, which of course is about the magical land of Narnia, about Aslan the lion who's the lord of that realm, and about uh, human children who in each book are swept out of this sort of mundane world uh, on this, you know, spinning rock uh, into a richer uh, world of Narnia on some adventure or other. Uh, some of you have read these, you know these, and uh, they're beloved stories. Uh, Magician's Nephew is about uh, a, just a, kind of a wacky adventure uh, of Diggory, 
uh, his friend Polly, Diggory's uncle Andrew, who's kind of a mad scientist, magician kind of guy who finds a way into other worlds. Uh, along the way, they pick up a, a wicked queen who, out of spite, destroyed her entire world and now sits in triumph upon its ashes. They collect her. They find themselves in London on a crazy adventure where, you know, this uh, evil witch from another world is trying to take over London. Uh, they pick up a cabbie along the way. And eventually, after all of these, just, I think it's his wackiest book, crazy adventures in London, they find themselves back in a different world that is total darkness all around them. And it's total darkness until this rather ragtag group uh, hears a voice. In the darkness, something was happening at last. A voice began to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the, from the earth beneath him, beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words. It was hardly a tune, but it was beyond comparison. The most beautiful sound he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. Uh, what he soon finds, uh, and what everybody soon finds, as a little light begins to dawn, is that there is a lion who has opened his mouth not in a roar, but in a song. And as he sings, things just start to happen. So here's what happens. Two wonders happen at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices. More voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it. Far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness, next moment a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out, single stars, constellations, and planets brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds, the new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen it and heard it as Dickory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves that were singing, and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. What's happening is that the, the lion shows up into the void of darkness. And, and this time there's someone around to observe uh, uh, the, the creation. And as the, the lion begins to sing, uh, his song materializes uh, in the form of stars which then join in the song themselves. Uh, he goes on and he, he forms the, the dry land and, and the sea, and as he continues to sing, trees and uh, sprout up, and all manner of creatures spring into existence at the voice of Aslan, who is singing his song. Uh, different people react to this differently. Diggory, Polly, uh, the cabbie driver from London, uh, who, you know, may be an uncouth man, but he's spent a little time in a church and he's sung some hymns, who all are deeply moved by the beauty of Aslan's song and seeing reality spring into existence at his voice. Uh, others, like Uncle Andrew, who lives only for his own selfish pursuit of power, uh, he responds differently. The longer and more beautifully the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. <laughs> Uncle Andrew did. He, he soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else if he had wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Narnia, awake, he didn't hear any words. He, only, he heard only a snarl. Uh, Uncle Andrew wasn't stupid in the sense of an IQ. Uh, he was stupid in the sense that he was not sensitive to the beauty uh, of what this lord of creation had made. Uh, the, the writer, I can't remember the, uh, the author of Waiting for Godot, he wasn't stupid. Uh, but he also, he couldn't hear the song. Uh, so with Uncle Andrew. 
Uh, what about the witch? She, uh, she responds a little bit differently. Some, at some point in uh, the crazy adventure that she had in London uh, prior to being drawn into this nascent world, uh, she and her superhuman strength, you know, she was like 10 feet tall, uh, strikingly beautiful, severe, and extraordinarily powerful. Uh, she had uh, devised a weapon for herself uh, out of a London lamppost and was swinging it around, threatening everybody, and she was still clutching to uh, this bar of iron as she swept into this dark world that is yet to be created. Uh, she is filled with nothing but repugnance uh, at the song that is sung by Aslan. And unlike Uncle Andrew, who just grows stupider and stupider, she knows exactly what has happened is happening. She knows exactly who it is that is singing this song and what he is accomplishing uh, by this creative song by which things spring into existence. Uh, left with nothing to do, with nothing else other than to take this iron bar that she has collected from London, she lobs it at, uh, with all of her might at Aslan, who spryly moves out of the way and it plants itself right into the ground. You know, kind of uh, satanic rejection of the creator. Uh, everything, however, is um, growing and creative at this point. So the this bar of iron grows up and turns into uh, a lamp. And it is at this very lamp that if you've read The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, this very lamp post... Uh, will first illumine the path of Lucy into the land of Narnia many hundreds of years later at the beginning of her adventure, which will end up with her destroying the very queen, uh, the very evil witch who first threw that bar of iron. Oh, something's happening there, isn't it? Even the rejection, the violence against the creator can be woven into the creator's good purposes so that uh, her very act of violence become the, becomes the means, uh, the, the light used to illumine the path of Lucy into this world that will eventually, through her efforts and through that of uh, her siblings and ultimately through Aslan himself, will lead to the defeat of evil. Astonishing. What was it that uh, Joseph said to his brothers who betrayed him? Uh, what you meant for evil, God has meant for good. Well, hang on, that's quite a story. Uh, a, a number of elements really stand out. I'm going to really try not to be like Orpheus and turn around and try and put this in some kind of analytical gaze, but uh, surely we, we could pause and reflect upon... Uh, the richness of this imagery that underlying all of existence is a song? Have you not heard at various points of your life that song? Uh, the, the beauty of love shown to you by family? And when that melts your heart, isn't that hearing the song? Or the beauty of God's creation that you enjoy at moments where, you know, you're, you're driving over the Battery Creek Bridge and, uh, at sunrise... Uh, and you're arrested by the beauty of it, of the, uh, that early light dawning over the marsh. I mean, gosh, isn't that the song? Uh, isn't there a witness that creation itself has? Doesn't the psalmist himself say, sing to the Lord a new song? You know, in, in that psalm, I think it's 46, he's not or 146, he's not talking to human beings. He's saying, sing to the Lord a new song, all the earth, to bear witness to us who are singing a very different song that we might repent and return to the Lord. Isn't there something within us who are perhaps waiting for Godot? Or the many people living in, you know, uh, a world of brute fact. Isn't there a longing for a story that would give coherence to our lives better than, well, you become whoever you want to be on this spinning rock in an ever-expanding universe, growing ever colder with each passing day as the heat uh, that we need for life just dissipates endlessly into the void. It's a different story. No good story can be told if we don't start with the story of creation. If we don't believe we have been summoned into existence by Almighty God, then no good story could be told. It's all make-believe on a spinning rock. 
but what if a song underlies everything? Ah, that's different. On to Tolkien. Uh, very few have read The Silmarillion. Uh, uh, some have begun, uh, even fewer have finished. Um, I haven't finished it. I started it a year and a half ago and I read little bits here and there. But uh, at the very beginning of the Silmarillion, uh, there is uh, the story of creation. When I read it, it, it was arresting. I, I wonder why did I wait so long to pick this up? Absolutely stunning story. So I'm, I'm just going to tell you the story, make a few comments on it, uh, and you know, not do the Orpheus look back. There was Eru, the one, uh, God, uh, who in Arda, I won't go into all the details, that's the realm of the gods, uh, is called Iluvatar, which means all father, or the father of all. And he made first the Ainur, the holy ones, they're sort of the angelic council, uh, who were the offspring of his thought, and they were with him before aught else was made. And he spoke to them, propounding to them themes of music. So he speaks to them in music. Uh, teaches them how to sing. And they sang before him and he was glad. Oh, what a beautiful image. I mean, this is uh, sort of a deeply Christian kind of thing. I mean, um, you know, God in his council, uh, with his council of angels whom he has created and what is going on forever in the heavenly court, uh, singing. You know, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah hears glimpses of this in Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, well, that's what's going on in this, um, uh, in this account uh, of Tolkien. And keep in mind, he's not trying to replace Genesis. Uh, he's trying to illumine aspects of it. But for a long while, they sang only each alone, or but a few together while the rest hearkened. For each comprehended only that part of the mind of a Luvatar from which he came. In the understanding of their brethren, they grew but slowly. Yet ever as they listened, they came to a deeper understanding and increased in unison and har harmony. So it's like uh, uh, music class. They're all learning how to sing. Occasionally you hear uh, some harmonies emerge and it's, uh, they're improving in the song. Uh, but this is all preparation for what's to come. So there they are, uh, Eru or Luvatar and his council of the Ainur, the holy ones, the angels. Then Luvatar uh, said to them, of the theme that I have declared to you, I will now make ye, uh, I will now that you make in harmony together a great music. And since I have kindled you with the flame imperishable, uh, what is the flame imperishable, I wonder? Could it be their existence? Ye shall show forth your powers in adorning this theme, each with his own thoughts and devices, if he will. But I will, sorry about the typos, sit and hearken and be glad that through you great beauty has been wakened into song. So now all sing together. I'm going to give you the theme, and you all are going to do variations on this theme. Uh, so there is a creative contribution that each one has to make, but the theme is Iluvatar's. There they are singing. But now Iluvatar sat and hearkened, and for a while it seemed good to him. For in the music there were, new, there were no flaws. But as the theme progressed, it came into the heart of Melkor, to interweave matters of his own imagining that were not in accord with the theme of Iluvatar. For he sought therein to increase the power and glory of the part assigned to himself. To Melkor among the Ainur had been given the greatest gifts of power and knowledge, for he had a share in all the gifts of his brethren. Who does Melkor remind you of? Yes, a kind of envious desire to, to make something of his own. Uh, so what's happening is they're all singing. Uh, Iluvatar gives the theme, you know, whatever that, you know, there's often a, th there's a theme that runs through classical music and then variations uh, on that theme as it, uh, it unfolds itself. Uh, and so Iluvatar gives the theme. All are singing according to the theme except for Melkor who env enviously seeks to make his own theme. Uh, and he starts singing in a discordant fashion with all of the others. 
Uh, it's not jiving with the rest of the music. He had, that's uh, uh, Melkor, he had often gone alone into the void seeking uh, places, in the void places, seeking the imperishable flame. He wants the power to create. For desire grew hot within him to bring into being things of his own. And it seemed to him that Iluvatar took no thought for the void, and he was impatient of its emptiness. Yet he found not the fire, for it is with Iluvatar. But being alone, he had begun to conceive thoughts of his own, unlike those of his brethren. Uh, what ends up happening is there's just the uh, cacophony. Um, the, uh, the holy ones, the Ainur, seek to sing according to the theme of Iluvatar, even with their own creative variations. Uh, but like a turbulent sea, it's running into conflict with the, the new theme introduced by Melkor, which almost sounds like trumpets, we're told, blaring the same note over and over and over and over again. Of course, that's the creativity of sin, isn't it? Uh, uh, it's loud, uh, but it's almost, it's just the same thing over and over and over and over again. What will Iluvatar do? Well, Iluvatar rose, and the Einar perceived that he smiled. And he lifted up his left hand, and a new theme began amid the storm. Like and yet unlike to the former theme, and it gathered power and had, no, uh, had new beauty. But the discord of Melkor rose in uproar and contended with it. And again, there was a war of sound more violent than before. Until many of the Ainur were dismayed and sang no longer. And Melkor had the mastery. So it seems in this battle of the song, now Iluvatar, the creator, and Melkor, the Lucifer, singing against one another, vying in battle. Why doesn't Iluvatar, I mean this is a deep question, why doesn't Iluvatar just snap his fingers and uncreate Melkor? Remove from him the flame imperishable. Uh, why indeed? Then Iluvatar arose again, and the Ainur perceived that his countenance was stern, the wrath of God. And he lifted up his right hand, and behold, a third theme grew amid the confusion, and it was unlike the others, for it seemed at first soft and sweet, a mere rippling of gentle sounds and delicate melodies. But it could not be quenched, and it took to itself power and profundity. So what happens is, um, Iluvatar sings, and against him is the singing of Melkor, and so Iluvatar introduces another theme where all of the discordant elements are woven into a new theme that begins to emerge. I uh, can't remember, was it Miles Davis, a uh, great jazz trumpeter, who said he could in any key play any note uh, and it could be uh, comprehensible and beautiful. Any note, like even a note that it doesn't fit the key, yes, it can all be incorporated into the music. Uh, so that's what Melkor does. Uh, there are the discordant notes of Melkor. Uh, that's what Iluvatar does. There are discordant notes of Melkor and it's just woven into the theme of the master. And it seemed at last that there were two musics progressing at one time before the uh, seat of Iluvatar, and they were utterly at variance, at variance. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated trumpets. Uh, and it had little harmony, but rather a clamorous unison of many trumpets bray braying upon a few notes. And it essayed to drown the other music by the violence of it, its own voice. But it seemed that its most triumphant notes were taken by the other and woven into its solemn pattern. There's the singing. In the midst of this strife, whereat the halls of Iluvatar shook and a tremor ran out into the silences yet unmoved, Iluvatar arose a third time and his face was terrible to behold. Then he raised up both his hands, and in one chord, deeper than the abyss, higher than the firmament, piercing as the light of the eye of a Luvatar, the music ceased. So in one final note, all is resolved, uh, high and low, beyond any creaturely imagining. Final note is given by a Luvatar, and then the music ends.
Uh, what happens next, uh, after the, the entire uh, song has been sung, uh, each playing uh, his part, uh, what Iluvatar does is he sends a fire out into the dark void. And whereas the music could only previously be heard, now it uh, springs into light and existence, and all the history of the world uh, is unfolded. Uh, each of the notes of all of the holy ones become movements in the, the reality of history, which then uh, is played out before the eyes of all in no longer just a song reverberating out into the void, but in real existence. So what has happened, that we realize at the, uh, the conclusion of this story at the beginning of the Silmarillion, is that what Iluvatar has done is he's been singing the whole creation and all of its history into existence. And everyone has their own part to play in the singing, almost as if you, know, you, e you indeed even have your own part to add to the song of all of creation, hopefully doing beautiful variations on the theme of uh, the creator. Dreadfully, in some cases, some seek to sing, make a theme of their own and live at variance with the theme. Are you tracking with all of them? I mean, what a, what a deep kind of thing. But, but look, all of the movements of evil, everything introduced by Melkor or those who are like him, which, you know, chief of sinners that I am, uh, I've, I've, I've brayed out a, a few uh, discordant notes in my time. But what, what happens is Iluvatar sort of smiles at it, sometimes looking at it with a stern countenance. Uh, he sings a theme that weaves it into uh, the overall beauty of the song. Uh, what was it Joseph uh, said to his brothers? What you meant for evil, God has intended for good. Uh, what is it that happens when uh, Queen Jadis, the evil witch, throws the iron bar at Aslan? He dodges it and it becomes uh, used in his own good purposes to overcome the very queen who threw it. Astonishing. Uh, what happens when Melkor brays out his discordant notes? Uh, it, it just enhances the, uh, the beauty and the depths and uh, the solemn nature of the song that is being sung. You know, when we tap out left-hand bass notes on the piano, just boom, 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 uh, it can be part of the, the song that uh, the composer intends. Uh, two stories of creation, uh, both have a number of fe features common to it. Uh, I wonder if uh, we could just draw a, a couple of points out and leave much of the story. I would encourage you to read the whole of uh, the, the, uh, the story at the beginning of the Silmarillion. Um, I can send it out There's a, in a PDF form uh, so you don't have to buy the book, although you could. Uh, it will amply repay any attention that you give to it. Uh, deep story. What, what can we learn from these two stories of creation told by these modern myth makers? I'm just going to draw out two points. I'm not even going to do the preacher's three. <laughs> First, and, and you know these are, what, these are what we as Christians and what Tolkien and Lewis as Christians might have to say to those who are still waiting for Godot. You know, the, the show about nothing. Uh, existence is not brute fact, nor is it random chance or just there. Uh, existence, but it's, a, it's, it's more like a song. You yourself, everyone you have ever met, uh, every beautiful thing you have ever encountered, everything that is, uh, is the result of the voice of God which has been spoken or as these two would have it, sung into the void. What a difference does that make? Is it possible, living in a world such as this that has been summoned to existence by the voice of God, is it possible now to live lives of meaning? Is it possible now to tell better stories than waiting for Godot? Surely. Second, evil is. I'm, I'm going to pause there for a moment. Evil is. Um, it was Karl Marx who said, religion is the opiate of the masses. It, it's designed to numb you uh, 
you know, narcotically against uh, the harsher aspects of existence. You know, put blinders on and uh, uh, give you a kind of pie in the sky kind of mentality that can just help you cope. It's a just giant coping mechanism for Marx. Uh, not so. Uh, here is a story, you know, look, if there is the beauty of a song, uh, doesn't that give us a greater ability to recognize uh, discordant notes than those who have no song? You see what I'm saying? If we believe in the good, doesn't that allow us a greater, deep appreciation of that which is evil? I would suggest those who believe in a creator uh, it's the opposite of the opiate of the masses, numbing us to the harsher aspects of reality. It gives us a greater sensitivity to them. Because we recognize that there are some things that agonizingly just don't fit. There are some notes within each of our lives, whether we've perpetrated them or they're against us, that have no place within a beautiful song that the Lord is singing. Sin, evil, suffering, deprivation, grief, all of these things are notes that uh, are at odds with that beautiful song that the Lord wishes to sing into existence. You, you, you see what I mean? And we could acknowledge that, but we don't stop there. We don't just say evil is. Uh, we also recognize that uh, it's woven into the song. Uh, what is it that Paul says, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Again, what does Joseph say? What you meant for evil, God has meant for good. Uh, this isn't a denial of the, the theme of Melkor. This isn't a denial of the hideous rejection of the creator in that uh, iron bar that's hurtled through uh, the air to try and uh, destroy him. It, it, we can acknowledge all of that as Christians, I think Lewis and Tolkien are saying. We can acknowledge the evil that is within the world that befalls us, that we perpetrate. Uh, but we can also hopefully expect that in the end, a final note shall be sung. And this time, by God alone, the curtains <laughs> will close. Uh, this, the final note that will be sung will be as high as heaven and deeper than the depths of the earth. Uh, the human mind will struggle to take it all in, uh, but it will take all of the threads of the song. Uh, every thread shall be woven into, finally, the resolution that God alone will bring about where all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. Well, I've gone from preaching. I think I've, I think I've looked at Eurydice full in the face, and she, she vanishes. But before that happens, uh, it's the song that underlies everything that these two have to say to us. What a remarkable thing. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Um, I have just enough time uh, to dismiss you. I almost did it. Uh, I was looking at that clock, which is five minutes slow. So, uh, If there are any questions, I'll entertain a, a few of them um, before I send you back into the uh, daylight savings darkness. Uh, any questions? Thank you. thank you. Well, thank you all for your kind attention. You're a great audience. Couldn't ask for any better, so bless you. I really hope to see you next week. Um, it, it really is uh, in the battle of good and evil where we're going to really hit our stride with what these two have to say. So I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, see you next week. Uh, God bless you.